Today I'm going to a talk at a local London church. This is part of a series of 10 talks. Uh, it's open to the public and it's all about misconceptions and myths surrounding Christianity. And of course the whole point of this is to supposedly dispel those myths. So like I said, it's open to the public and they invite you to ask questions, actually to text in your questions, which I'll be doing. Uh, it's week five, and tonight's subject is, is LGBT, in other words, the gay question, is it the worst possible sin? Is it a sin? Something along those lines. So I thought, ah, how are they going to uh, uh, explain this? So I'm gonna go along. I'm going to text in my questions, and if I like what I hear, I'm going to get up and applaud them. If I don't like what I hear, I might have to get up and speak to the panel afterwards and tell them exactly what I think. And we want you to feel incredibly welcome tonight uh, as part of our meeting. We, put, we have these every Sunday, and this um, series that we're going through is a 10-part series, and it's just trying to start discussions or address the topics that lots of the world have about Christianity or um, conceptions that people might have about Christianity, and we want to we tackle those honestly and openly. So we will have a text-in number throughout the entire um, message, but we do want you texting in your details to my Stone Age phone, and I'll try and... Um, decipher them as, as the message goes along, and then we'll put them to the panel um, at the end. So please do text in, um, that'd be brilliant. Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be back here. I hope you're enjoying the service so far. If you don't know me already, my name's Howard, one of the leaders of the church here. Tonight's topic is a pretty demanding and challenging one. We set it as a question for the title, myth number five, Christianity says the worst sin is being LGBT, question mark. So I want to start by saying that I think Christianity today is more known for what it's against than for what it's actually for. And I think the church is partly to blame for that. In um, 1971, at the Christian Festival of Light, it's recorded in the book called The Gay History of Britain, a story is told of how the Gay Liberation Front, the GLF, infiltrated this Christian Festival of Light. And they dressed up as nuns and they released mice to scurry amongst people and they engaged people in conversation. Tragically, pretty horrifically, I think, the woman who released the mice for the GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, hit over the head repeatedly by a handbag whilst being shouted at, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. It's pretty shocking. Actually, when you think about it, the contradiction between the words that are being said and the action that's being taken. But at least something positive is being said. Tragically, that isn't really often the case these days. I think of the church, Westboro Baptist Church in America, where members of that congregation proudly will stand and pick it with signs saying, God hates facts. I don't know about you, but personally, that releases in me a sense of righteous indignation and anger at people who behave in such an unchristian and ungodly way. And on behalf of these people who may have subjected people in this room to pretty horrendous, horrendous experiences, all I can say is, is I'm sorry. And on behalf of the church, we're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry that we didn't express more clearly and more strongly a stand against such unchristian like behaviour that Jesus himself would, I think, actually have hated. So that's the time that I want to begin this evening's message with. But then I also want to say that I think homosexuality has been seriously misunderstood because of an intense media battle that has taken place over years, if not decades. It's been the issue, if you like, which the church has been confronted and challenged with. And because of that, that's what the media reports on, this conflict that's out there and taking place. And as a result of that, it kind of gets elevated because of the amount of communication and conversation that's taking on about it. And because it's this, this big, hot topic of debate, most people, I think, looking on from the outside might presume, mistakenly, that Christians are saying this is the worst sin. Because it's perhaps the most talked about subject by 
the church. But I think, as I said, that's because it's been, that point is being challenged. But it's a shame that you never hear the positive side of the church either in the media, sort of as a side You never hear the good news stories of what's happening in the church and all the good things that the church is doing, caring for those in need in its community, from food banks to debt advice centres to job clubs, all kinds of things that are taking place. And these services have been provided to everybody, even LGBT people who may find themselves at a difficult point in their life. If somebody who is LGBT was refused services from our food bank, we as a leadership team would be absolutely horrified. But I'm really pleased that as I've done the research for this talk, I've discovered that there is a growing number of people with same-sex attraction who have described themselves as being LGBT, who have had a, a more positive reception and experience, more positive welcome, a warmth from the church itself. Now, you may be thinking, I've never heard that, that's new to me, and you might not believe me actually saying that that's what's been happening in recent years. And so I want you to listen to the testimony and story of a, of a man who's a celibate Christian evangelical man, indeed a minister in a church, who has same-sex attraction. He's called Sam Albury and... If you're listening on the podcast, you're not in the room, you're not going to be able to, to watch this, you can look at it at livingout.org. So this is Sam Albury's story. Sam Albury, I live and work in Maidenhead, and I'm a church pastor. I'm a Christian because I know that Jesus died for me, that he rose again from the dead, that there's good reasons for, for believing those things. I'm a Christian because the message of Jesus makes far more sense of, of who we are as people and the way the world is than anything else I've ever come across. The church has been great with my whole issue of same-sex attraction. Certainly the church I'm a, I'm a member of uh, have been supportive, they've been an encouragement, people are, are wanting to, to be a good friend. And I've also appreciated that it's not defined how they see me. It's not the lens through which they view me. So they, they've been great. I've not had any experience of Christians getting angry or rejecting me because of it. Most people haven't really battered an eyelid and just sort of thought, well, we've all got our own issues. This is one of yours. I hope experiencing same-sex attraction, having to kind of wrestle with it, I hope it's made me a more empathetic character than I would have been otherwise. It's not always been easy. But I think going through that has helped me, I hope, to be a bit more patient with other people, to be a bit more understanding, I hope a bit more compassionate than I would have been. Being single actually has been a, a real blessing. It, it's given me opportunities to do things I wouldn't have probably got around to doing if I was married or had children. And it's given me a, a capacity for friendship that I don't think I would otherwise have. And it, it means a lot to me to be able to have a wide range of friends and to be able to, I hope, be a good friend to others. Having same-sex attraction isn't always easy. Obviously, I'm experiencing desires that I don't want to have, and that is at times can be very, very painful. That can be quite frustrating. Um, there are times when it's made some friendships a bit tricky. And there are times, obviously, when, when singleness isn't much fun either. All the, the sort of opportunities and advantages of it, there are times when it would be nice to have my own family. I'm convinced what, what the Bible says on this issue is good because I'm convinced God is good. I'm convinced God is good because actually Jesus has shown his goodness to me in his, his death and resurrection. I see the goodness of his, his words in, in so many areas of, of life. The one who, who made me and knows me better than I know myself is going to know what's good for me. The very best thing that God can do for anyone is to give them life in his son and the Christian life is all about Jesus and for as long as God is offering a relationship with Christ to anyone he is not anti them. Uh, there are things God calls all of us to, to turn away from, there are things in, in all of our lives that we need to uh, to rethink and to, to kind of give over to God but actually knowing Jesus is, is what it is all about and that is the greatest gift God can give us. And as long as that gift is being offered, and it is, God cannot truly be said to be anti anyone. One of the things Jesus says that, that most, I guess, encourages me in this whole area, and I, I, I hope it encourages others in other areas too, 
is that Jesus said on one occasion that, that anyone who leaves uh, fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and homes and other things for him and for the sake of the gospel, even in this life, will receive a hundredfold in return. So, although we have to give things up to be Christian, although we have to turn away from certain things, leave certain things behind, actually we, we always, even in this life, receive far more back from Jesus than we ever give for him. And so, although there'll be certain kinds of relationships I'm, I'm not going to enter into as a Christian, um, I've received back from Jesus a whole wonderful other set of relationships um, within the, you know, being part of a Christian community, being part of a church family. Um, and so it's, it's never a bad deal to follow Jesus. Great. You can find out more on their website, livinghelp.org, as I said a moment ago. But just to be clear as we move on, I want to say that Christianity does not say that the worst sin is being homosexual. Actually, and I want to be careful here if I can with my words, Christianity doesn't actually say that it's the outward expression of homosexual practicing behaviour that ultimately will end you up in hell. Just as it doesn't say that being a practicing heterosexual will get you automatically to heaven. You see, the real issue of what gets you to hell is self-righteousness and is mistakenly thinking that you can be your own Lord and Saviour. Homosexuality like adultery or envy or, or greed are sins that the Bible says are not good for human flourishing. And the heaven and hell issue is actually about your relationship to Jesus Christ, about whether you accept him as your Lord and Saviour, about your reaction to the claims that he makes as to being God. What is your response to him? That's what determines the heaven or hell issue. So if you like, it's really the, the sin issue beneath the sin issue is it expresses itself that really matters. Now, yeah, okay, I called homosexuality a sin. Now, that is actually, I think, a brave thing to kind of come out and say in this day and age and in our culture. And I hope you can appreciate that. Because today's culture, even conservative MPs would say that those like myself who hold to a traditional view of marriages between a man and a woman together, rather than a man and a man or a woman and a woman, they would call us bigots. And one MP did that not long ago. In fact, we'd be called homophobic, we'd be criticised, we're stigmatised. And in a way, it's not dissimilar to those who came out years, maybe decades ago, as being themselves gay or homosexual. They were stigmatised and criticised by society. And so, in a sense, we share something in common, that level of stigma and criticism for the views that we hold. But I did say that homosexuality is a sin, so how do you justify that? Well, as Christians, we believe that the Bible is our authority. So it's not my prejudices, it's not my feelings, it's not my experience, it's what, is, what does the scripture actually say? That is our, our authority, that's what we're, we're going to, to determine what is right and wrong. Now we've said a lot already in this series about um, authority and the authority of scripture in week three of Mythbusters, so I don't want to kind of go over that ground again if that's okay, but I will say this, is that you need to have um, an authority in your life. We all have an authority to determine what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. And you have to ask yourself, how reliable is that authority? Can you trust that authority? We hold to the authority of Scripture. And so there are six passages, well, at least six passages in Scripture that deal with the subject of homosexuality, same-sex attraction. And if you haven't realised this already, I'm going to kind of park the discussion, at least for the talk, of the whole issue of gender. It's just too big a topic to deal with the two together, so I'm going to focus on the issue of same-sex attraction. And because of time restraints, constraints as well, I'm going to skip over Genesis 19, which is usually the first passage that's talked about and go straight into the two moral um, passages that come within the Holiness Code in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 18 and 20. There are moral precepts that have been given to the people of Israel that say that homosexual, homosexual practice is a sin. And that comes sort of sandwiched in between the middle of a whole set of instructions which primarily relate to the issue of incest, and then this sort of book ended with uh, commands against bestiality as well. And within that, there's these laws about homosexuality. And so the question has to be asked, are these still valid for the, for the Christian in the, in, in the New Testament era? Now Jesus has come. Do we still have to live by these kinds of rules and moral principles? Well, Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 5 that he came to fulfil the law, not abolish it. 
We would accept that many of these moral principles like murder and theft and indeed incest and bestiality is still valid and relevant today. We would still see them as moral principles. So if that's in the context with its, in which homosexuality is found, that's interesting. So we have to have a criteria to be able to separate and distinguish that homosexuality from these other practices. And I would argue that it's just not there in Scripture. Indeed, in the New Testament, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he deals expressly with the issue of incest and expels a man from the church in Corinth for committing incest, for having sex with his mother. Now, if these laws are so close to each other and Paul is saying that this law of incest is still relevant, it's still a moral principle that we must abide by, then surely the same must be true for homosexuality since they come so close together within this holiness code. Now, I'm not saying by this, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm really not saying that, or not trying to say that, homosexuality is akin to incest and bestiality in the sense of sinfulness or something like that. I'm really not saying that. I'm simply saying that they are together in the passage, and we have to have an argument, which I haven't found yet or accepted, that is able to distinguish the one from the other in terms of their application today, morally. In any event, though, the New Testament goes on to have a consistent practice, a consistent position against the practice of homosexuality. So, three particular passages in the New Testament, one of them, which is the clearest and most important, is Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. So much so that I'll read just a short portion of it. Romans chapter 1, from verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged, that's the first exchange, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Then here's the second exchange. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshipped and served created things, rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even though women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones, in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations. This is the third exchange he's describing. The men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Now that's a challenging passage, but I think it speaks about the whole of humanity. That's the context in which Paul is writing. He's writing to the whole of humanity. And I don't think it's acceptable really to say that this passage is only dealing with exploitative homosexual relationships like pederasty between an older man and a young boy, or between a master and a slave, or, or male prostitution and so forth. I don't think that's right because the scripture as we read it says that they were inflamed for one another with lust, they desired one another. This is a mutual relationship between two parties, not one party over another party. And it also refers to lesbianism and there's no evidence at all in the ancient world for exploitative relationships between women. And so I don't think that's an acceptable argument. Neither do I think you can argue and say that this is a prohibition that Paul is writing against a different type of homosexuality, in the sense that today's homosexuality that we know is kind of a loving form and expression of commitment and faithfulness. Whereas back in Paul's day, the only homosexuality that was there was exploitative and excessive. Because actually, if you do your research and you read and you look into the ancient world, you can see that although it wasn't as common, that there were still genuine, it seemed like, committed same sexual unions and relationships. And Wikipedia can give you a whole list of those if you're interested. But moreover, if Paul wanted, or God through Paul wanted to kind of define this passage as being relevant only to a particular type of homosexuality, then he could have done that very easily by using the Greek word for pederasty. But he doesn't use that in the passage. And as well as that, there's this sense of an unnaturalness or naturalness that's referred to by Paul, this exchange that's taking place. And I think what he's doing here is not saying that there's a difference here between 
what's happening in his culture, and there's an exchange from the majority heterosexual position to a homosexual position in terms of their orientation, because what I think he's doing, because the whole passage of Romans 1 is full of echoes of creation, Genesis chapters 1 to 3, I think he's going back and saying, this is not about an unnaturalness with the present culture, but it's an unnaturalness against God's creative natural principles as he established them to be. And he's talking about here a man and a woman fitted for each other, physically, emotionally, holistically, not exclusively, though, although a key function would have been for the procreation of children. And that is the unnaturalness that Paul is talking about with the creation principles. But what then about Jesus? What does he have to say about homosexuality? Well, some say he's got nothing to say about it. He's silent on the issue. But that's actually technically true. He doesn't seem to say anything directly about it. Yeah, you're right there. Uh, I take your point. But then an argument from silence is always a dangerous argument to make because he doesn't say anything about incest or bestiality either. And I think that's because these things were known to be sinful in the context of his society. It's just an accepted norm. He didn't need to speak about it. But he does, Jesus, say something subtly about the subject of homosexuality. In Mark chapter 7, he condemns all forms of sexual immorality using the Greek word porneia, which was a catch-all term for all forms of sex outside of a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman. And then there are these other passages we don't have time to, although we can in the panel discussion talk about 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that also deal with the subject of homosexuality. But more importantly, all of this teaching has to be taken together and put in the context of the Bible's grand narrative that begins with a heterosexual relationship of marriage, Adam and Eve, together, and finishes with a heterosexual relationship between Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, his bride. That is the context that we are moving on. God has made a man and a woman to each other not just for the exclusive purpose of procreation, but to complement one another in ministry. And he's bringing all of history to that goal between Jesus and the church. And so this then leads Sam Aubrey himself to write in his excellent book, Is God Anti-Gay? This statement that's behind me, I'll read it in a moment, but I'll just say, this is a significant statement for him to say, because he would be looking for any possible reason that he could find, and indeed he says this, to say that the desires that he has for same-sex attraction are legitimate in scripture, but he can't. He says that it is simply not possible to argue for gay relationships from the Bible. This is not always an easy word to hear. It has sometimes been very painful to come to terms with what the Bible says. There have been times of acute temptation and longing, times when I have been in love, and yet scripture shows that these longings distort what God has created me for. So where does this leave a same-sex attracted person then? What if they're born that way? They're going to just have to deny their, their, their identity, the way that they've been made? Is that what we're expecting them to have to do? Or are they going to have to live a life of, of loneliness as a result of this? That doesn't seem fair. That seems cruel. That seems unjust way to make people live, doesn't it? Well, you, you could think that way. But Ed Shaw, who's um, another church leader, pastor, has written a book. He himself battles with same-sex attraction. It's called The Plausibility Problem. And in it, he argues that Actually, living a celibate lifestyle as somebody with same-sex attraction is, is plausible, but it's plausible only if we deal with a number of missteps, nine missteps that the church has taken that make it hard for those with same-sex attraction in the church. Let me summarise them for you. The first misstep is that your identity is your sexuality. For a Christian, that quite simply is not true. A Christian's identity is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. It's a secure, solid, stable identity, from being a spiritual orphan to being a beloved child of God. It's an identity that cannot be changed or taken away from you. It's the most wonderful thing that gives a sense of assurance and comfort to a believer. But if you put your identity in anything else, it's transient, it can move, it can change. Especially sexuality, because we know people who move from one position of sexuality to another in terms of their orientation. Or if you even did it in terms of how many times you have sex and things like that. That's not a solid basis to determine who you are, why you're here, what you're living for, your identity. We'll talk more about that on week seven of the Mythbusters series. The second misstep, though, is that a family is simply mum, dad and 2.4 children. 
Actually, this isn't true for a Christian. A Christian's real family is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together with the church family. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says family are those who, who follow Jesus Christ, not those who are related by blood to him. This is a massive challenge for church. I think it means whether you're celibate because you're same-sex attracted and you, you're living in the church, whether you're celibate because you're heterosexually attracted and you haven't met your partner yet, or you're, you're called to a life of a singleness, it means that we as a church have got to be a family together to make sure nobody feels lonely or isolated. We don't cling together just in the sense of nuclear family, but we are really living out being one another's family, because this is what scripture teaches. There's no excuse, I think, for allow us to let people feel lonely in the context of a church. Family. The third misstep is if you're born gay, it can't be wrong to be gay. Well, Lady Gaga puts it like this. A different lover is not a sin. Believe capital H-I-M. I love my life. I'm beautiful in my way. Because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track. Baby, I was born this way. No matter gay, straight or bi, lesbian, transgendered life, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born to survive. Now, you might want to argue with me on this point, but... From the reading that I've done, I did a fair amount, but certainly there's a whole lot more that I probably need to do as well. But my understanding is that the science is still unconclusive on the real causes and fundamental basis for somebody being same-sex attracted or homosexual. Actually, it seems to point towards it being a whole mix of factors of both nature and nurture that affect a person's sexual orientation. But I want to argue this, even if a person is born that way, they still have choice. Choice about whether or not they want to accept and embrace a gay identity. Yes, they may not have choice so much about the same-sex attraction feelings that they have. But they do have a choice about whether they want to embrace that as an identity. And they also have a choice about whether they want to live that out and practice those desires. See, one of the central truths of the Bible is that we're actually all born simple. Psalm 51 says this. We're all born in sin with a predisposition to sin, and yet the Bible holds us responsible for the choices that we make. And so somebody is born gay, or they're born with a propensity to be angry and violent, which is genetically, one would assume, possible. We'd never argue and say that that is an excuse to say, well, that's the way that you were made, therefore you can just concede those traits and live that out that way. No, no, no. Our society would hold them accountable for the actions and the choices that they make. The fourth misstep is the kind of popular philosophy today. If it makes you happy, it must be right. But I think today people's understanding of happiness is so short-sighted, it's so short-lived, it's so unfulfilling relative to what Christianity offers. is a super-sized experience of pleasure in the new heavens and the new earth that is to come. And if we live with an eternal perspective, a heavenly perspective rather than an earthly one, it will actually make us a whole lot happier in our circumstances and situation than satisfying ourselves with lesser pleasures in this life. And those pleasures quite often, they let us down. They're not just temporary, but they require more to get the same fix or hit than we got the first time that we engaged in that pleasure. And, and quite often, some of them have pretty unfortunate consequences as a whole philosophy, like you know, smoking cigars behind me. The fifth misstep is that sex is where true intimacy is found. There is, of course, intimacy in sex. We talked about that in week one of this series. That's not the exclusive place of intimacy. Intimacy is quite possible between uh, other relationships that take place, friendships that take place. You can experience great intimacy in those friendships, as Sam himself was describing, as we're honest and, and real and open with each other and not superficial, as we share each other's burdens and carry each other's blows. Indeed, I think friendship is the key and secret to every heterosexual marriage, and that's why marriages can continue to succeed where sex is no longer possible. It was never possible, maybe even from the start, in a heterosexual marriage for biological reasons or later on in marriage through age, yet what is the glue holding this relationship together? It's the intimacy of friendship, which we mustn't overlook. The sixth misstep is that men and women are equal and interchangeable. I don't think we are. I think we're different by design. This is a glorious and beautiful thing. The sexual difference actually, I think, makes heterosexual marriage a lot harder <laughs> For sure, if you're married, you know that, but also actually better because of that. A lady called Melinda Salmus um, 
who was same-sex attracted, Christian, uh, she was in a sexual relationship with a woman in the past, is now actually married to a man with children. She perceptively writes this. She says, it's because of, and not in spite of, the tensions between the sexes that marriage works. Masculinity and femininity each have their vices and strengths. The difficulty when you have two women or two men together is that they understand each other too well and are thus inclined more to excuse than forgive. That frank bafflement which inevitably sets in in any heterosexual relationship. Why on earth would he do that? I just don't understand. That never set in throughout all of the years that my girlfriend and I were together. Naturally enough, we were both women and we chose each other because we seemed to be particularly compatible women. You see, there's something very special about the complementary way that men and women come together, especially in the context of parenting, of raising children. The economist and self-identified gay atheist, Matthew Paris, wrote this. He says, I am glad I had both a mother and a father, and that after childhood I was to spend my life among both men and women. And as men and women are not the same, I would have missed something if I had not learned first about the world from and with both a man and a woman and in the love of both. The seventh myth step is that godliness is heterosexuality. The goal of true Christian living is actually to become more like Jesus Christ, not to become married. I think that's a really tragic misunderstanding that the church we often communicate because we do believe in the value and importance of marriage. But we, actually, that's not an exclusive calling for everybody in the church. There is a calling to singleness, but the calling that is higher above all of those is to holiness and to becoming more like Jesus Christ. Holiness, godliness, is not a sexual orientation. It's a whole of life disposition. The eighth misstep is that celibacy is bad for you. It's not. Actually, I want to say that it could be a fun and exciting adventure. For me, it was until age of 31 when I got married. It was exciting. There are things you can do as a single person you quite simply cannot do as a married person, especially if you've got children, you're committed. You're restricted in, in some ways. You, you've made your choices that have limited your, your freedoms in order to have certain freedoms, but as a single person, they've not made those choices, so they've got other freedoms. Paul actually writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that it's easier to live the Christian life if you're single. That's really interesting, and because of that, many men and women have done extraordinary things as single Christians because of their singleness, because of the freedom that has brought them. The adventure of mission. I think of people like William Carey, the father of modern mission, pioneer of mission to India, done extraordinary things. He couldn't have done it if he was married with children, I don't think. Or Gladys Allwood, great work that she did, amazing in China. Probably couldn't have done it if she was married with children. The final misstep, misstep number nine, is that suffering is to be avoided. Actually, for a Christian, it's, it's really not. Suffering is something that we need to embrace. Why? Because we're following a suffering Messiah. Jesus, who himself was crucified, and through suffering upon the cross in spiritual and physical agony, takes upon himself the sin of the world, that we might go free, gains victory through suffering. In Mark chapter 8, Verse 34, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, we all have desires and passions that we have to deny. We can't just go around having sex with whatever attractive person that we see whenever we want. It's not going to work. I mean, even society says that's not, that's not a realistic way to live. It's not good for yourself, it's not good for the other person involved, even if they did want to reciprocate. If you're married, it's not good for your spouse. If you've got children, it's not good for them. We all have desires that we have to deny. We all have impulses that's right to deny. But that doesn't mean that there's a valueless of that suffering, of that denial. There can actually be great beauty, great purpose in suffering, as Jesus himself demonstrates, but also for us, in our lives. Sam Albury says this, however much we have to leave behind, we are never left out of pocket. If the costs are great, the rewards are even greater, even in this life. For me, these include a wonderful depth of friendship God has given me with many brothers and sisters, the opportunities of singleness, the privilege of a wide-ranging ministry, and the community of a wonderful church family. But greater than any of these things is the opportunity that any complex and difficult situation presents us with to learn the all-sufficiency of Christ, learning that fullness of life and joy is in him and his service 
and nowhere else. So the biblical response to homosexuality, it's a, it's a plausible one. But the unbiblical response, and I want to say this as best I can, with a genuine sense of love in my heart for those who are listening, because I believe it's loving to warn those who are taking a path, which I believe in good conscience is potentially perilous. The unbiblical path of simply going on in a pursuit of pleasure is, is a dangerous one. See, it's resistance to rules or any form of censure or check can actually end up cheapening the very thing it pursues until there's no pleasure left in it at all. Think of it like this. Imagine a burnt out and broken car. And this car has been left out in a field. It's worthless. It's junk, right? Until you put a, a fence around the edge of it. And when you put a fence around the edge of it, you increase its value. Maybe you've got a scrapyard. If you put walls around it and a roof over the top of this card, it becomes a garage. But the more boundaries that you have, the value inside increases. And this is what God has done with sex. He's put boundaries around it so that it can operate within safe boundaries of heterosexual marriage. You step outside of those boundaries, you're in danger of devaluing and reducing even the pleasure in the act of sex itself. On the 30th of November 1900, Oscar Wilde died a lonely and tragic death at the young age of just 46. He spent his life, the majority of it, in the pursuit of pleasure. And he castigated or criticised anybody who attempted to restrict his sexual freedom. In 1895, he was convicted of homosexual acts, including some with young boys, despite being in a committed homosexual relationship and despite being married with two children. And whilst in prison though, and then shortly thereafter, as he reflected upon his life and how he lived it, he sort of had a, a, an epiphany. And he wrote this amazing poem called The Ballad of Reading Jail, in which he seems to identify with the main character as a reflection on what's happened to him in his own life and in the brokenness that has ended up particularly with his wife and children. He finally realises the foolishness of pursuing pleasure for itself. And how pleasure, if that is a person's ultimate goal and authority, will result in each person killing the very thing that they love. Let me read a few verses to you. I know not whether laws be right, or whether laws be wrong. All that we know when we lie in jail is that the wall is strong, and that each day is like a year, a year whose days are long. And thus we rust life's iron chain, degraded and alone. And some men curse, and some men weep, and some men make no moan. But God's eternal laws, I believe he's talking about laws of morality, but God's eternal laws are kind and break the heart of stone. And every human heart that breaks in prison cell or yard is as the broken box that gave its treasure to the Lord and filled the unclean leper's house with scent of costliest none. Ah, happy they who hearts can break, and peace of pardon win. How else may man make straight his plan, and cease his soul, cleanse his soul from sin? How else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in? In Reading Jail, by Reading Town, there is a pit of shame, and in it lies a wretched man, eaten by teeth of flame. In a burning, winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there till Christ... Call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear, or heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. The day before Wilde died himself, he did an extraordinary thing. He called a priest to come to him. This is an amazing concession for a man who had resisted living God's way all his life. He called a priest to him. And it seems, although we can't prove it for sure, that he had a deathbed conversion. And in this epiphany of revelation, he turned from pursuing pleasure to pursue Jesus Christ himself. And you know the truth is that we've all sinned sexually. You, me, we've all sinned sexually in some way. And we're rather like the prodigal son in Jesus' great parable. And we've sowed our wild oats in various different ways, whatever that may be for you. But if we come to our senses, if we turn from living apart from God's way and his boundaries, if we come back to
to God, we realise that he's there as a father, a loving father waiting, longing for us to make that glance back to see him. And when we see him there, he's coming, running towards us, willing to humiliate himself. The parable describes man lifting up his loins to, to run towards this returning son, to open his arms wide and to embrace him as he comes back into the fold, into his love, into that relationship. And all the time, in the mind of the Father, he's planning to celebrate a party to welcome home this returning child. This is what's on offer for us if we turn from living against God's ways and his rules. If we come back to him. This is the offer that was made to Oscar Wilde. And if God and Jesus would take Oscar Wilde back, then whatever you've done, I'm sure he'll take you back too. Let me just take a moment to, to pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we pray for all of us who've fallen and sinned sexually, whether through same-sex attraction or lust. Lord, whatever it may be that we have done, Lord, we thank you that forgiveness is available in the cross of Jesus Christ. And we want to come and sit at the foot of the cross and praise you that because of your sacrifice and because of your suffering, we might go free, we might be healed, we might be made whole. All of our guilt and shame taken away. And Lord, we ask you to help those who are struggling with this issue. And to know your presence, your grace, your compassion, your love for them in their difficult and trying situation. In Jesus' name, Amen. Can we just give Howard a round of applause? I think we dare about where we are. Um, we'll just have some quiet music in the background. The panel will come up and take their seats and then the questions will be asked. We've probably got enough questions uh, that have been texted in, but there will be a roaming mic around. With the first question, and there's, there's sort of different, some different topics that have been coming in, so thank you very much for the questions. They, they, are, they are really good. And sometimes I've tried to summarise a group of questions that are similar into one. So if we haven't addressed yours specifically, do um, put up your hand if you want it to be further answered. But there will be time at the end as well to come up and um, chat to people individually. But the first question um, to kick us off is uh, around the whole Old Testament references. Um, if we're happy to condemn homosexuality because of what the Old Testament says, why don't we condemn getting tattoos, eating shrimp, um, women speaking from the front, and uh, why don't we stone women who are caught in adultery? So I guess it's a reference to Old Testament law, um, the punishments for that, and then there's a further question that I'll add to it, but straight off, why, why don't we condemn those are things that are referred to in the Old Testament in the same way that we seem to with homosexuality. Great, do you want to kick us off with that? When God prohibits something in strong terms, in the shape of a command, it is usually because it is going to be destructive of our humanity and our dignity as men and women made in the image of God. We all know that um, there are things that we have done, we have felt ashamed of ourselves. And people have done things to us that have harmed us seriously. Some people have grown up in families where abuse is common and violence and incest with one or both of male or female children. No wonder, therefore, God has addressed this matter of sexual activity very strongly, as has been summed up to us very, very, very informatively by Howard, with the arguments for the position that the Bible adopts here. And I would say this, that God is the God of relationships. He is a threefold entity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is a family. And God loves family because he loves the Son and he loves the Holy Spirit and they love the Father in return. So what God wanted for us is to have relationships filled with love and looking out for the welfare and honour and glory 
of the people that we're most connected with and those that we're not yet connected with. So, God has modeled something for us. And he doesn't want it violated. He doesn't want us to be cheats, adulterers, child abusers, abandoning fathers, or witchy mothers who manipulate and bring guilt feelings to their children. But this is why the norms of the relationships that we see in the Bible are the pattern that we're to live by. Okay, um, so that, that's addressing the general, the general theme of uh, the pattern of relationships. But Tyson, if you could address specifically this, this question of uh, why are we, I'll say it, why are we allowed to eat shrimp but we can't uh, engage with homosexual activity because both of them seem to be prohibited in the Old Testament? Well, I would think that if, um, if, the, if some of these laws were only prohibited in the Old Testament, then you could say, well, that may be a cultural context. Um, but the, the thing with homosexuality, is, as Howard pointed out, is it's not just we're looking at one verse and basing this, this doctrine off of just simple one little sentence in the Old Testament which says, you know, homosexual uh, practice is a sin. But um, there's, there's multiple places in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament that, that actually um, talk about this um, thing. Whereas I think something like shrimp, I, I don't think I've ever encountered that in the New Testament or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I would say in the cultural context, it's probably quite different. Okay. Howard, if you could um, go a step further with that question as well. But then also, related to now, um, because some countries still seem to have an Old Testament penalty for same-sex attraction. Uh, so in Nigeria, it was tested in, in Nigeria or um, in Russia, for example, there is legal punishment for people who are engaging in this. Should we as Christians sign online petitions for them to change their laws? Or actually, what have we, have we got it wrong okay. um, on that? But maybe follow on from the last question as well. I try my best, there's quite a few questions in that, to try and remember. So just to follow on, I think, to hint at what Tyson is saying, we look to the New Testament to help us to interpret the Old Testament and the laws, and particularly the person of Jesus Christ. So he says he came to fulfill the law, but not to abolish it, not to take any sort of dot of the I or cross of the T, if you like, in our language, away from the law. So we have to look at Jesus and say, how does he fulfill the law and live out that law? And if you like, he's like a filter through which we understand what the Old Testament means and makes sense of. But there's other things as well in the New Testament that we can see. So the food laws, you'd have the vision that was given to Cornelius, where he sees this sort of strange thing on a rooftop of all these animals, and God saying to him quite specifically, and get this right, um, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. He's saying it about all these different types of food, you know, probably some shrimp in there, I don't know, all kinds of other things, some, some pig, all, all that sort of stuff wrapped up, but God was saying that as an illustration to say that yes, all foods are now clean for you, it's not that, that there is a factor within that as well as in terms of your witness to, to eating food offered to idols and the impact that others might perceive that upon, but all food is clean for you and therefore the gospel is relevant to those who are Gentiles as well as Jews who have seen Gentiles were seen as unclean. So there you've got a very clear New Testament interpretation saying that that law is no longer relevant, that law is, has been fulfilled in the person of, of Christ, but the fulfilment of the law is the ongoing moral relevance of the law that I think Tyson's talking about. And we have scriptures in the New Testament that are talking very clearly about an Old Testament practice. That helps us really clearly say that those laws are still very much valid today. So we've got Romans 1, we've got 1 Timothy chapter 1, we've got 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or well, from 5 to 7 in that, 1 Corinthians chapters 5 to 7, dealing with the whole issue of sexual relationships, not just homosexuality, but incest and the body being a temple for the Holy Spirit. So there's a, there's a whole lot of information about that. So I don't think we're kind of you know, just picking and choosing what we want. But by converse, you've got the other side. So if you're taking the other position, you've got to decide, well, why are you picking the one that you want and rejecting all the others? Because we still do accept things like incest are immoral. And we are still basing a lot of our moral code and principles on what is there. So how are you then jettisoning what, what you want to jettison and keeping what you want to keep as well? We're using the interpretive tool of the person of Jesus Christ and really scripture for that. The second part of the question is, is a more difficult question. It's more about um, 
what should the role of a Christian be engaged with politics, which I think is a slightly different issue, and therefore within that, the realm of homosexuality. My view would be that because for our context, we live in a democracy, and so Christians are called to be engaged with politics, principled persuasion and active participation, would I say, are the two keys that Christians should be engaged in. Engaged we can't force people to embrace our views and make them Pharisees because they're living it just as a sense of rules. They have to do it. We want them to actually embrace it because it's what's right and best for society, ultimately. And that's where I think we would want to argue for those things. I can only really talk about the context and country that I'm in rather than make statements about other jurisdictions that I don't understand or know enough about. So, well, these, these two questions are a bit more personal. Um, if, and I'll address you, Greg, if an openly gay couple wanted, I guess maybe, maybe, maybe separated out, so wanted to attend Westminster Chapel and then further wanted to become members of Westminster Chapel, how do we address that? And I, I would, I would add, I, I would probably say this question is more getting at if, if an openly gay couple wanted to become members of Westminster Chapel, would we expect them to give up their lifestyle in order to become part of this church? We know that sexual sin is one of the most life-dominating practices that can bring us into bondage and ambiguity in our lifestyles. But the church and the gathers, gathered congregation there, all of us carry sins into this building. And we'd probably be the first to admit it, if not publicly. There are things that we've all, all committed that we were ashamed of and perhaps still are ashamed of because it's ongoing in our lives. But, but the gospel is for sinners. The gospel of Christ is preached every single week in this church because it's good news, euangelion. It's a great announcement. And whoever comes to listen and hear is not going to be damned by the preacher in the pulpit or alienated. It's a gospel of grace and the, the notes of grace are mu good music for people to listen to. And of course, some sins are more life dominating than others and more difficult to get rid of. But the presentation we've had tonight has been a grace-filled message, totally honest, totally direct, and totally true to what the Bible teaches. So the onus then is upon the hearer as to what they're going to do with this truth. And it's capital T truth because it comes from God's word. And if it's capital T truth, it's true for all people in all places at all times, male or female. And if we've listened carefully to the arguments that we've heard, we know the origins of why this problem has arisen. God created Adam and Eve perfect, but they were seduced by lies, satanic lies, and they crossed a boundary, and a great flood was the result. Theologians call it the fall. A perfect man, a perfect woman, a perfect marriage was ruined that day. And that's the origin of the sex war and the dominance and cruelty of men and the manipulation and wheedling of some women. We are not perfect now. It's only the gospel that can renew us to the original intention God had for men and women together, including the conception and raising of children in families. There's never been a perfect family since Eden, but there are families that approximate to that, who know the wisdom God gives in his word to raise children properly and to be married for a long time. Just before we go on to the um, next questions, has anyone got any further additions or further questions um, that they would like to ask with the open mic? Uh, again, a personal one, uh, and anyone can, anyone can take this. How can, then, a gay person deal with their sex drive? <laughs> it's a pretty hard question, to, I think, for us to answer, I'll be honest with you, because...
because because I, I don't that's not my personal struggle. Um, but I, I do struggle with sexual sin. I'm not, not ashamed to admit that. So if I look at that through the lens of how would I deal with my own sex drive, I, I'm a married man, so I can look at it, how would I deal with it before I was married and how did I deal with it after I was married. And varying degrees of effectiveness to that, but I think the most helpful principle is, is to die to sinful traits and to say I want a desire to put sin to death, but if I do that in my own strength, I'll ultimately fail. And so I have to lean upon God and ask him for his power, his strength. God, help me. Help me to put this to death. Help me to die to sin. And also to put on the positive. Help me instead to, 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 to look at women in a godly, loving way. These are, these are beautiful people made in the image, image of God and in your likeness who you love and care for. That woman one day be another man's husband. You know, potentially. And all, the, all this kind of stuff. Thinking through a biblical position. So taking my mind away from that which is sinfully tempting and putting it upon the beauty and goodness of God and what he's planned and purposed and asking for God's help through his power and through the Holy Spirit to do that. I might, uh, I'll add a, an element to that. Um, just because, so I'm, I'm going to be making a film soon um, about my, my story and I won't go into very many details but I had a real struggle with this sort of thing with um, sexual attraction with um, sexual desires and as, as not yet married all the time I realised after becoming a Christian this was a problem, this was a real issue um, and it took a long time uh, to be totally honest, it took a very long time um, but the, the biggest principle that I had to live by was there is something more valuable than what I want right now um, and as Sam Albury was saying, there is something far more valuable to me that is the prize of Jesus Christ and eternal life with God um, that has to outweigh everything else, has to displace it, um, has to come in and move the other thing out of the way. And it is tough. It is unbelievably tough. Um, but that's my personal um, answer to that bit is... We're not, we're not trying to say this is an easy thing, I'll just get over it, not at all. Um, it is unbelievably difficult. Um, but my personal testimony is God's got me through many, many years um, of healing and of strife and real struggle. Um, but brought me out the other end and he is so worth it, he is more valuable than anything um, you could possibly want or desire that the world might afford you. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep on in this, in this sort of topic. Um, questions about nature and how would you touched on it. And it's, it's a difficult one. Um, and I was reading a paper that came out in 2014 about uh, the genetic makeup of someone to, to predispose them to being um, gay, to being um, same-sex attracted. But the question maybe is slightly more bluntly worded, and I'll read it out. Science has identified the gay gene and determined homosexuality is not a choice, but Bible verses call it an abomination and detestable. How does that work? Or maybe add, add another question to it so you can answer it, answer the theme of the question. Homosexual behaviour is found in 400 species of animal, thus it's natural, so how can we call it unnatural? Can I start with the second question first? Is that <laughs> okay? Um, Growing up in our family, we had three dogs, three pet dogs, who I loved dearly, different types of animals and dogs, but they did certain things that um, I don't do as a human. So one of the dogs licked, I don't know if I'm going to say this, this guy's not going to lie on there, but one of the dogs would lick its testicles. Have you seen a dog do that? Have you ever seen a dog do that? Come on. Uh, other dogs, they go around in the park, you're chasing them, they're sniffing each other's bums, things like that. Other things that happen in nature as well, uh, a black widow spider eats her mate, her male mate, after she's mated with him. We don't do these things as human beings. So there's a limitation upon nature that, yes, there may be these activities, but we just don't naturally apply everything from nature. It's not our ultimate kind of source for how we behave as human beings. But also, if you're taking the nature argument to its logical conclusion, you do have a difficulty if you're applying nature only because you're working against natural selection. And if the process that nature works through is through natural selection, that's your, your argument then obviously homosexuality is, is flawed because there is no progression from it. It doesn't produce 
offspring. Um, I've forgotten the first part, <laughs> conveniently. So I, I, I would word it slightly more like this. There is, it's been shown that there is a genetic predisposition to some people being uh, same-sex attracted. Um, doesn't that doesn't that sort of get rid of this unnaturalness that we that we accuse it of, or saying it's a detestable thing, um, and it's unnatural if it is actually in people biologically to be more predisposed to this? Tyson, why don't you? Okay. Yeah. So I uh, so I, I would think that the the claim would would kind of go that any natural tendency or behavior uh, is is morally acceptable. That would be the claim. Is that just because it's natural or? or, um, you know, this is how I was born, that it's automatically moral. Um, but any natural tendency or behavior, um, just because it's, it comes naturally, doesn't automatically assume that it's moral. So, for example, if we were to find a gay bashing gene, or if we were to find, uh, as some studies have suggested, that um, those who are psychopathic killers have something that is born in them, that in their brain tells them to kill people. Now. The, the correct response is not to say, live this out. Embrace your, your psychopathic tendencies. No, it is to, to fight that temptation. Um, this is just common sense. So it's just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's automatically moral. That, that just can't be naturally assumed from the, the law. That can't just be the logical conclusion of the argument, I would suppose. Any other thoughts on that, or should we? I think we must understand that the word what's natural does not mean necessarily the way God designed things to be. What God designed was what I alluded to, a perfect man, perfect woman, capable to be married and then bring perfect children into the world. And then the great thud. We're on the other side of the great thud. And we need to be aware, therefore, what we call is natural, or what is unnatural. Unnatural, basically, is anything that is um, a perversion and a warping of God's original design. And that's where we start, because it's foundational. Now, we've all been warped in all kinds of ways. But we don't want to lie down and wallow in our weaknesses and vulnerabilities and our temptations that we fall to. We don't want to live in ways that displease God if we love God and know God. We want to serve Him with everything that He's donated to us and the good gifts He's given to us outweigh all of the things that are our vulnerabilities and weaknesses. There's not a person in this building that hasn't got a, a hundred reasons to thank God for your life. I would say probably more accurately thousands of reasons, even if you've never voiced them. And therefore, to a God that has been so generous, there should be a return of thankfulness and submission to Him and His will. The will of God makes us more human. The will of God makes us more real. The will of God takes us into a destiny that has been planned for us before we were ever born. And if we exchange that for limited, occasional, seasonal and disappointing sexual experiences, most of which that are forbidden in God's word, we have made a very poor bargain. Because that's not how life is to be lived. It is to be lived by discovering the will of God and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to increasingly grow in your holiness and dedication and sanctification in God. That's the Christian life. Would I go back to the life I had before I was a Christian? No. In a dysfunctional family, emotionally damaged and lost. But the next part of my life has been the most wonderful adventure of all. And it's lasted over 40 years now. We'll wrap up very quickly. I just 
an addition to that as well, because my lecturer at university was one of the leading guys who wrote the review paper on um, the biological background to homosexual attraction. And the, the, the key to answering it is there is no one gene, because that would be easy to find. Um, so biologically, it is an accumulation, a combination of multiple genes that maybe increases your predisposition to following those actions, but there is a, and they, they say it in the, um, I've got the paper up at the moment, they say that it, it simply influences your behavior, the environment, uh, personal decisions, all of those things have a huge thing to play in the entire, how you actually act it out. So the argument, science says this, it, it, it simply doesn't. Um, and actually the spokespeople for LGBT addressed this article that was brought out in 2014 and said we don't want we we don't base our case we don't like that sort of thing that these people are doing this because it's like iphones a new one comes out every year and it just seems a bit further but it, it's saying something else um so it's it's simply not what science is saying as well um, so I, I wouldn't round everything on that final question um to round us off how should a Christian talk to someone with same-sex attraction about Christianity? I think for me, when you don't know what to do in the Christian life, the word love is the secret and answer to everything. Um, and I think sometimes as Christians we, we simply don't know what to do or how to have that conversation. And so we need to think, what did Jesus do? And I think I see Jesus being the friend of sinners and going out and reaching the people who others would ignore or reject or ostracize or dislike. Uh, and I think we need to be on the front foot of showing love, which would be care, concern, interest, support, wanting to look after, all these kinds of ways and expressions that, that love has as we, we see it lived out in the church life and in the scriptures. That's, that's really what we should be doing. And I think having that closeness and friendship and trust uh, and expression of love which is known and received gives you much easier opportunity to talk to somebody about that issue. Tyson, do you want to add one thing and then pray us out? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Jesus says that the, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God, all right? And he gets that from the Old Testament, but then he adds to uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, who's your neighbor? Now, your neighbor is your Muslim friend, Okay, he's your, your, your non-Christian friend, he's your homosexual friend, he's your heterosexual friend, he is your Christian friend. That's who your neighbor is. And so uh, that's who we're called to serve, that's who we're called to love. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's like what Howard's saying, is that's the thing that I think Jesus himself would have done. Now, in, in an age where you'll be labeled intolerant, bigot, that kind of thing, it's very possible to disagree with someone's views, but still show them love. And I think that's where a lot of times... Uh, non-Christians or uh, LGBT uh, fanatics, as it were, would, would look at the Christians and say, you are intolerant because you don't agree with me. I mean, this is a self-contradictory statement, but it is, um, you know, it is just that we as Christians ought to be loving and, and love our neighbor as Jesus calls us to do that. So uh, that includes our homosexual friends as well as friends of other religions and, and whatnot as well. So now I will pray as Andy has told me to pray. <laughs> Father God, I, uh, I thank you uh, for, for this talk. I uh, thank you that Howard presented it so, so graciously and lovingly as, uh, as possible. And, uh, and if there has been any sort of um, misunderstandings on, on the hearer's part to think that we are being unloving, ungracious, unkind about this issue, I pray that, that we would be able to, to repent of that. And uh, and to to see that this is um, this is something that you've you've um, you you care deeply about, and um, so I just pray that you would you would give us the grace to to deal with these issues in a loving way, uh, whether we are Christians talking to non Christians or if we're non Christians dealing with the intolerant Christians. Um, so I pray that we would have a good evening as we go out of this place. And I thank you that you've brought every single person here to hear this wonderful gospel truth, uh, capital T truth, uh, this evening. It's through Christ that we pray. Amen. 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 Can we just give these guys a round of applause?
And we would like to offer prayer for anyone who wants to receive prayer about anything. It could be, a, it might not be related to this talk. Anything you want, uh, please do come to the front and, and ask us for prayer. We'll be hanging around here. If you've got further questions about this topic, um, certain bits, we didn't address all of the questions, um, but as I said, we'll be addressing them on the website. We'll be having a go at those sorts of things. So, but also do come up and chat to us um, afterwards. There are refreshments out in the lounge now, and I hope you have a lovely week. Um, I've said fourth with, but whatever word is like that. Goodbye. So, um, how did you feel it went tonight? Because it's, um, it's a diff touchy subject, isn't it? Difficult to know, really. Yeah. Difficult to know. Trust. Just trust God that it went okay. Really. He'll, yeah. he'll, he'll, he'll put it to work. It's the same whether you feel good or you feel bad. I think after giving a message or a preach, my experience is you just have to say, God, you're in charge. I will have said things I should have said. Uh, no, I'll, I'll have said more than I plan to say, which is all good, which he's given me. And we trust God that he'll do the rest of the work. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it came across loving. I, I, guess, I guess that's the main thing, is that if... Not all of it did. No, okay. No, i got to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, this is called Mythbusters, and at the end I felt you were reinforcing the myth that gay people, okay, they exist, we can't help that, but don't have a relationship, don't fall in love, certainly don't have sex, don't have children, you know, because the Bible says so, we can't get around it. So uh, I didn't really expect that, but that's, that's how it came across. And I know yeah. you have to go back to the authority of the Bible, but when I look at things like that, knowing gay people as I do, and having them boarding in my house, which I do, um, I look at that and I think, hmm, was the Old Testament written by men with prejudices who happened to live in the Bronze Age and didn't understand the way we understand now? Yeah. And the conclusion I would come to is yes. Okay. That's just my outlook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I ask the difficult questions to see what answers I will get back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll, I appreciate that. You yeah, should, please tell me. I'd encourage yeah. you if to I'm wrong, read please a copy of um, this book here. Plausibility problem. Yeah. Because that's where I was getting that information from. Okay. Um, he's a same sex attracted pastor, church leader. Yeah. He's a church, battles with that, lives a celibate lifestyle and explains why he's happy living that lifestyle. So he's suppressing it. He thinks it's, um, he's suppressing it in the same way that, you know, I might be suppressing my desire to have sex with other women at times. But he's suppressing his desire to be who he can only be because his. Yeah. Faith and tells him to. That's where he would take issue. He would say, "That's my sexual desires are not who I am ultimately." Yeah, yeah. He's saying who I am, and that's why he would never call himself a gay person because yeah. that's not his identity, and that's a dangerous thing. He's saying to accept. I, I have same-sex attraction, yeah. but I choose not to identify myself as as a gay person because that's very restricting and limiting. Um, yes. And his and how he's thinking, and so his approach would be to say. Um, yeah, that, my identity is I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. That's mm. how I find my source, not in the expression of, of any desire. But you can a, a you would agree that you not. could be a gay person, not tell anyone, not wear a rainbow shirt, not go to Pride, just keep it to yourself. You know, I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, most gay people do, and they're only just now yeah. brave enough to actually yeah. come out and tell people. Well, it's, it's, it's really one of, I suppose, my concern. Yeah. But in the context of if they were came if they came and wanted to talk to me and ask for my opinion and what do I think, I'd, I'd tell you the same thing mm. to them as best as I could. Yeah. But if they want to choose to live that way, they choose to live that way. My primary concern for them would be to, to teach them and introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. And uh, if they accepted him, to understand the consequences and the cost of following him and what it means to mm. follow Jesus. And I'd be talking about the resurrection and the evidence for that to, to, to do that, yeah. that conversation. Yeah. And if they want to follow him, this, this is what it, what it means. And explain that, try and introduce him to people like these guys who, who battle with that issue but have read the scriptures and would be looking for any kind of loophole where they might escape. But they, they well, that's, that's, that's what they're trying to do is find a loophole. So okay. what that pastor is doing is saying, okay, I'm gay, I want to be Christian, I want to belong to this community but I can't have all the privileges that a straight person has, so I'm just going to switch it off and pretend 
that I'm not who I am. Oh, no, no. I think he would say he continues to battle with that, those temptations all the rest of his life. Yeah. Well. But he chooses to not allow that temptation to enter into what he would consider sin from his view of scripture. Mm. But he's he would surely be the person as a theologian, as a church leader, studying the scriptures, if there was any way that he could find a reason in the Bible to allow him to practice that, then he would have found it, but logically, mm. you know, he has it. And he's saying, look, this is how I read scripture, and so I choose yeah. to deny that, just as loads of people deny all kinds of expressions of, of sinfulness yeah. in their own lives. Yeah. Um, from whatever, from looking at pornography, if you're a Christian, engaging in adultery, or having polygamous wives, and mm. multiple things like that. People may have desires for these things, but the Bible restricts it. Having sex before marriage, um, so the same battle that you know is there for a same-sex attracted person. It's, so it's the way we are, though, for, for a straight person. I mean, as straight men, we know how difficult it is to keep yeah. the sexual yeah. urge. You know, the Bible but why should we? I say, why should we? I mean, if God put yeah. us there, put it there, if it was God, yeah. you know, and it's, it's like Him saying, "I'm going to put this desire in them that is so strong, you're going to go crazy." But if they act on it before marriage or whatever, that's it. That's why would he do that? I think he put it in there in a, in a good way, but it's been distorted by sin. So this Greg's big bump like that, yeah. you know, that's kind of made it not what it was. Originally sex was intended in, in a good way, but because yeah. of the way that sex is so rampant in our culture, and what culture has done with sex has made it into a god to be worshipped. And we live in that culture, and we're affected by that, and we embrace the values of that culture. And so we feel more intensely that desire mm. uh, in a sinful way than in the way that God originally intended it to be. And I yeah. think simply saying that we have biological functions you know, isn't enough because as Paul Tyson said, that doesn't make it moral or doesn't make anything right or wrong. You know, if, you know, sex we know is, is actually more than that. It's, it's more than simply a, a physical thing between two people when they have sex. There's something more going you, you, on. Tyson, if you don't mind me saying, you, you, um, when you compared it to um, a serial killer or something like that, I mean, really, you can't put those on level peg again. Right. So I mean, there's a couple who want, you know, to just quietly go on and perhaps be in love, you know, and a serial killer, you know, that's, that, is, that is definitely a malady which needs to be fixed because it harms society. So, so yeah, so I think the, the comparison came because, um, because it, it was, the question was more so about genetics. So was that a genetic thing? Um, so there's something in the, in the brain of when someone's born that they are more prone to, to do a certain action, namely killing. Um, now, I, I'm not saying that, that homosexuality is the same as, as killing. Yeah, I'm just saying it's more so that there's, even if it is something genetically there, uh, that it doesn't make it more yeah. absolute. Mm. Um, I don't think you were comparing the two things and saying these are the yeah. same things. But yeah. They kind of came across that way. I don't know if okay. you meant that way, but it did no, kind of come No, definitely didn't. That if it did, yeah. then that's... But they're only yeah, similar sure, and that they've both got issues about whether yeah. they're biologically yeah. determined or not. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sort of similarity yeah. rather than the nature of I wouldn't say yeah. homosexuality is something which is... Um, which is some sort of a of an aberrant mutation in the way that perhaps serial killing is. That is something which we need to breed out if you want to if you want to say, or, or fix. Homosexuality is always going to be like two percent of society. It's nothing, you know. It's not going to it's not going to ruin the world. It's been around forever. You know, the world's not collapsed. Um, you can't you can't really yeah. put it. In I that mean, category. I suppose it's sort of like from our position that we take scripture as our authority. Yeah. We believe that what God says is what's best for humanity. Mm. And if people want our view and we're talking about it and if they're challenging us on it, we'll defend it and explain it yeah. that this is what's best. And, and there are some people who are from that background who would hear that, hear a conviction from God on their heart and desire to change. Yeah. There are others who will hear it and become more resistant or hardened or just indifferent mm. about it. And I think that that's the reality of the, the message of what we would say. Uh, and you know, we want we want to reach people who ultimately will want to live the way that Jesus says and what we understand he teaches in scripture for the reasons we've explained. Um, and, and that I, I think it's it's pretty hard to argue to be a Christian and um, affirms homosexuality. I, I think if you're 
push comes to shove, I think you're, you're losing your way of understanding what the scriptures are. And if you start doing that in your approach and saying this passage doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean that, I think because, of, because it's so clear, I think ultimately you, you, you don't have an authority. Your authority is my personal opinions, mixed in with whatever I, I want or like from scripture, which is affected by culture and emotions and things like that. It's not a, a Or just what we know thing. what works, you know, by looking around society, it's a see what works and what doesn't work. Thing. Yeah. I mean, we didn't get into it, but there are other books. I mean, this guy here, if you really wanted to read it, this is a really interesting book by Gagnon. Uh, it's a debate between two guys on the subject. All right, two Christian guys? Uh, two Christian guys. Oh. Um, <laughs> one for a, a pro-homosexuality position, one for a non-homosexuality position. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's got a lot of statistics that he's gone into, Gagnon, as mm. to the... What, what does practically work yeah and I didn't want to go into this because it is a really controversial subject yeah but there's a lot of research that has been done that, that shows some of the dangers and perils of homosexual relationships relative to heterosexual relationships in terms of the longevity and faithfulness studies of the number of partners the impact on children and there's a number now of children who've come up who've been raised by homosexual couples who've come out against the community I think you'll find that's this. false what you're telling me I, I think you will well, find that false. I'll show you an article, sorry, can you just... <laughs> I'll be dropping sure. um, I th one, thing, one thing, just quickly to mention, is that the, the myth was that homosexuality is the worst sin. No, sinning and against the Holy Spirit, and that is the, the greatest one. Right, so, so, so that's yeah. why I think... So It's not the greatest, but it's still considered So, so What do you think that sin means, though? Which one? Sinning against the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm just not supposed to do it. I don't know why. <laughs> so, so I guess that's, that's actually really a defiance of God's authority over a person's life. It's basically the sin of unbelief. That's what it, that, that sin of The sin of unbelief. In the context, it's not like it's a it's a sin of, of denying God and who He is and how He works in this world, mm. which is ultimately the position of a non-Christian. Yeah. The sin, the sin of blasphemy. Um, so yeah. So I guess if if the if the thought was like, I mean, for example, I, I came to church this morning and I didn't hear anyone talking about um, homosexuality. I come to church every week and it's it's very rarely discussed. It's it's not something that we kind of dwell upon. I mean, if you see Westboro Baptist Church, that is probably what they talk about every Sunday. But uh, it's, it's definitely not something that we as a church um, would... They're going by the Bible, exactly by the Bible. Everything they say on their colorful placards is in the Bible. They've got Levitic, Leviticus and yeah. the, uh, yeah. the Romans and everything. So I mean, we, in there. Yeah. So I mean, so we agree that it is a sin, but we just don't agree that it's the most important sin. I don't think I'm, you're going to find me going picketing, uh, you know, different areas no. and stuff like that. And 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 I think today is a one-off, right? Today is yeah. today is the day that we we do talk about it. But um, next week, you know, the chances are, are very minimal of this kind of just, you know, it's just mm. not something like I hang out with a lot of Christians, and we don't just sit around talking. About, oh man, how about them homosexuals, mm. right? We just don't we just don't do that. It's yeah. just not the worst sin. Yeah. Um, um, so what we believe You're still is. calling it a sin, which, which so, LGBT yeah. would find very offensive. It's like if you had a bunch of ginger people here and you were told that, well, the Bible says ginger people must be stoned. And it probably does say that. <laughs> and um, how would they but feel? That, so I can't, yeah. I can't help that. But that's not a relevant comparison what? between somebody who's got a genetic disposition for ginger hair. Yeah. There's no... And because they've got that, does that mean they have to, you know, only ginger-haired people will therefore behave in X, Y, Z Or ways. they say, okay, yeah, left-handed people, yeah. They can't, you cannot use a left hand, whack, I'm going to hit your left hand, use your right hand, which up until recently, that was the case in school seminaries and things like that. I mean, you know? this may sound really, really crude, but biblically speaking, technically, the closest comparison between homosexuality, this may sound very crude, is actually incest. Because incest is having sex with somebody who's structurally similar to you, related to you, mm. physically. And homosexuality is equally having sex with somebody who's structurally related to People you. who commit incest aren't, I don't believe, um, only attracted to siblings. It just is like a one-off. With homosexuals, it's like... You know, they reach 13 or 14 or something, they look out in the world, it's like, I'm supposed to be attracted to the opposite sex, but I feel nothing. Yeah. I'm looking at my own sex. Why is that happening? We may just end up disagree. <laughs> agreeing to disagree. No, I've asked them. No, 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 on the issue we may end up disagreeing. Well, in general? Uh, okay. Agreeing to disagree <laughs> on the subject. Yes.